Welcome to Turn the Page, the official podcast of the Syosset Public Library. Welcome to Turn the Page. I'm your host today, Jen, and I am here with um, an old colleague and now I hope maybe an old friend and a great writer and researcher and academic. <laughs> Could I ask you to introduce yourself and your book, please? Yeah. Hi, I'm Elliot Borenstein, a professor of Russian and Slavic studies at New York University. And my latest book is Marvel Comics in the 1970s, The World Inside Your Head from Cornell University Press. So this book was so exciting to read, and as a little bit of uh, auto bio for our listeners, I TA'd a class with you in spring 2014 uh, at NYU called Expressive Cultures, the graphic novel, I believe, right? And sure. um, some of the ideas that we were working with in that class have like ended up in that book, and I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit about, um, you know, your career as a researcher, how it led you to working uh, with comics, you know, after starting with Russian literature, and then maybe how, like, yeah, how the class also played into the writing of this book, if you could. Oh, sure. So, you know, I like to tell my students in the class that you probably remember this, that I, even though I have a PhD in Russian literature, I have many more years experience of reading comics than I do reading Russian literature, um, but obviously not professional experience. I read comics all my life, pretty much as long as I can remember. And, um, kept quiet about it a lot because I was embarrassed by it um, growing up because I was going to be an intellectual. And it took a long time to, to get over that. Um, and then, so I got my PhD and eventually I got a job at New York University. And after a while, I started running the uh, college core curriculum, which was then called the Morse Academic Plan, which is where you and I met. Um, mm -hmm. And the college core curriculum has a rubric, had a rubric for um, basically for arts and humanities. There was words, there was images, there was film. And I said, hey, why not graphic novel? And why don't I teach it? And, um, you know, since I was running it, I, I did, you know, I had to get approval from the committee, but it was pretty easy. And I decided I would teach this and it was lots of fun. Um, and I'd never actually brought these two worlds of mine together, comics and, and teaching. And I really loved it. And um, the students, you know, the students signed up for, they had to sign up for something. They thought it was going to be easy. Um, and I don't think it was the hardest course in the world, but it wasn't, you know, as easy as they were expecting. And one of the things with this book and with a couple other things that I've been working on that really sort of surprises me is, you know, in academia, we love to say, particularly to justify ourselves at these R1 research universities, well, te teaching and research are really, really related. And one of the reasons it's important we do the re research is it informs our classroom and vice versa. And in this case, it really did. I would never have written this book if I hadn't been teaching this class. Um, so teaching this class made me um, think about comics um, from the point of view of someone has to teach them, um, how to present it. Um, I I'd already started reading comic scholarship and I got much deeper into it. And um, along the way, I, to, in order to give these lectures, I had to give even more thought to these books that I've been reading for years. Um, and in particular, this book came out of um, a sort of fascinating frustration I always had with the teaching because the course um, move sort of chronologically, but not entirely. It starts chronologically because it kind of has to, you know, what were comics, right? And then when, by the time we get to the 1980s, then it's up, up for grabs, right? But before that, we, you know, we read Will Eisner's The Spirit, which the students always hated. Um, and then we go on to two things from the 1970s. Uh, this wonderful graphic novel, no one remembers anymore, The Sacred and the Profane. I don't know if we taught that when, yeah, um, about Catholics in space and Howard the Duck, which was for me, the formative comic of my lifetime. Um, and Steve Gerber, the writer is just the, I, I can't stress enough how, how important his, his words always were for me and how important Howard the Duck was. And I teach Howard the Duck. And what I became more aware of, something I understood already, was that one of the big differences in teaching good comics from the 1970s from teaching comics from the 80s and later is that could be considered graphic novels. That is, um, even the good stuff from the 70s has all these artifacts of, um, in them that are not just the product of the time, but the product of the production, the assumption that they're never going to be um, reprinted, the assumption that a long running story act doesn't have to have a title, that there's no beginning and no end. And so they're very poorly curated for just giving someone comics and saying, here, this is really good. You can hand Watchmen to someone, you can hand Mouse to someone, and they don't really need to know much besides what's in the book to get something out of it. Handing 20 issues of Howard the Duck to people. Um, there's just a lot of stuff, there's a lot of references to things that they don't need to, it's sort of, in a sense, it's sort of like teaching Chaucer. Um, you know? <laughs> um, but but for, with, with, less, with less reason, right? Um, so what I found fascinating was, you know, the extent to which 
the students are split. Some of them really, really liked it and some of them didn't. And I understood both sides. And it made me think about what, um, what this period of time was that was so formative for me as a reader and how I think it's formative for the history of uh, the medium in the United States, but has been not entirely overlooked, but overshadowed by what happened in the 1980s with you know, the big three of Watchmen, Mouse, and um, Batman Dark Knight Returns and everything else. Um, and that the the role and the influence of some of these writers, and it's mostly writers, I can get to that later, um, has been largely forgotten. So that's that was my step. That's so cool. And, you know, something I thought while I was reading it that didn't occur to me while I was, you know, teeing the class with you was that, um, you know, the, the 70s for Marvel is sort of interesting in oblique ways, like for the same reasons that I was interested in the Middle Ages originally, I think, you know, like this sort of overlooked period that is seen as like transitional and not really having any qualities of its own, but rather being like, you know, situated between two important periods and actually having a lot to offer when you actually look under the surface. So I kind of, I, I enjoyed that parallel, you know, sort of in my interest. <laughs> Well, that's a great parallel because I think with also the Middle Ages, there's amazing stuff there, but you really, you have to kind of walk people through it, you know, mm -hmm. um, in, in a way, and with, and, and with the 70s too, there's a, there's a comparison I made that one of my um, external readers didn't like so much and I kept having to couch, which is, I really feel like 70s Marvel is kind of the awkward age adolescence of, um, of the medium or the industry here. And that can be condescending and that can be, there's so many problems with that, but I still feel it's kind of true um, that there's, that the, even the even the good stuff is not like entirely good stuff, and the and the people who made it had no choice but to um in, to have these things about it that now seem kind of awkward to us. And I think that's fascinating. All the stuff that doesn't work is as fascinating as the stuff that does work. Absolutely, and I really do like that. Um, I personally liked uh, adolescence as its term because um psychologically it almost makes sense too because one of the things that you write about is how in this period you sort of see I guess the sort of the beginning of Stan Lee uh taking a sort of like a less dominant role in running it and sort of other voices kind of coming in so that kind of makes sense too that you know like dad is sort of not playing as big a role and now it's time for us to figure out what we want to do and how, what's that going to look like and you know that kind of makes sense <laughs> and dad is so embarrassing <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's very earnest and very excited and <laughs> yeah, yeah. oh yeah so I would love um you know I'd love for you to talk about um the comics that you've chosen to highlight in each chapter and sort of what drew you to choosing those properties um you know some that you've talked about already like Howard the Duck um but I I there's so much that you could talk about. And I, you know, I imagine that narrowing it down to sort of like the text that are going to organize each chapter is a very intimidating process. So can you talk about like, yeah, how you chose your texts? Oh yeah. In fact, the, the, I originally there were going to be three main writers. It was going to be uh, Don McGregor, uh, Steve Englehart and Steve Gerber. And then there was going to be a chapter that was Doug Mensch and um, Marv Wolfman and some other stuff in it. And then these things just got bigger and bigger and I decided they need to be their own chapters. But to some extent, it started out with the stuff that I just thought was just really, really good and representative of what these writers did. And once I once I had zeroed in on this idea of um, representing interiority, the inner lives of the characters, and also of, um, of creating or representing a voice, whether it's an authorial voice or the voice of characters, um, then that really, really helped the selection. So, um, you know, for instance, Doug Mensch, who was originally not going to have his own chapter, um, Doug Mensch was an interesting one for me because he's one of the ones who um, is very inconsistent. He has some really, really good stuff. And then he has some stuff that's just, he has not done anything bad, but he has lots of stuff that's just totally okay. Um, but where he excelled was these comics where you really, really get into the heads of the characters and um, and also comics that were not in the mainstream of superheroes. I mean, Werewolf by Night, uh, Deathlock, which was, I mean, Deathlock's gotten bigger, but Deathlock, you know, couldn't sustain a, a series to save his undead life at the time. And, <laughs> um, and Master of Kung Fu, which is one of the few comics here that I wasn't reading in the 70s because I wasn't interested in Kung Fu and had no idea it was so good. Um, but Master of Kung Fu... Um, to my mind, the great thing about it, besides the art, which is often really, really fantastic, and I do talk with Paul Galassi and Mike Zeck and Gene Day there, um, what I think is really great is the uh, ongoing inner monologue of, of Shang-Chi, um, which is expressing um, expressing often his conflicted feelings about what he's doing, about his place in the world, even as he's engaging in fighting. And this is the sort of thing that 
you know, in a different way would be developed in the 80s, say by um, Alan Moore and Watchmen to have uh, narration that isn't necessarily specifically about what you're seeing um, on the page, but is connected to it as a kind of commentary or parallel to it. And um, and Shang-Chi, I thought, just really did that really, really well. And that's one of the reasons why I've never been happy with anyone else's Shang-Chi since then, even when you have really good writers like um, Jin Yang on it, because without this inner voice of his, he's just a guy who kicks people. <laughs> uh, and I don't find that very interesting. <laughs> Could we talk a little bit more about Howard the Duck? Because it is one of the parts of the course that I remember uh, the most clearly because I went into that class like thinking that Howard the Duck was just a joke, you know, like I only really knew of it through like my <laughs> very, very young memories of the movie, which I remember also being a joke at the time, you know, and probably now uh, as well. Um, but like there is like so much more to the comic than you would get just from that sort of examination of it in like pop culture at the time and he's a character that sort of now has even like like when the you know when like the marvel uh cinematic universe started could you imagine that they would ever depict howard the duck like even just in a sort of like throwaway moment you know yeah. like can no. you talk a little bit about him and like yeah why he's so important and how we got there you know <laughs> yeah even these cameos with seth green as his voice um by the way i always felt the perfect voice for him and now it wouldn't work but the the the, the live action personality who's most like howard the duck is louis ck oh my god um, yeah. from his from his series you know this kind of earnest disappointed funny person right um setting aside all the other louis ck stuff but seth green is really great for it. what the biggest surprise for me about his even cameos in the marvel universe is i cannot think of a, of a property that is more toxic for hollywood after um how after the howard the duck movie than howard the duck it was such a god-awful movie and i remember i was in college when it came out i dragged a friend to see it it's funny yeah, i know it sounds stupid but this is the best comic in the world and then i just thought oh my god what have i done how have i tortured this person for two hours with the with the um worst possible movie ever um by a screenwriter who clearly didn't get it my my favorite thing that of comment that the writer made about it is um uh something like well um, it's a duck from outer space. It's not like it's some existential philosophical thing or something, which is exactly wrong, right? Yeah. So um, Howard the Duck was a huge sensation in the 70s. And I, I, I joined him a little late because I think I was actually a little young to really appreciate him. Um, so when he started off as this uh, one-off character in Man-Thing, Yes, Man-Thing, which was also another good Steve Gerber comic, um, he, uh, he had this huge following. He had to be brought back from what seemed to be death. Um, and there was even a moment in, in 1976 when there was this Howard the Duck for president campaign and there were buttons and all of that. So um, so Howard the Duck, you know, would be mentioned on the news. Um, so he was he was he was really something. And, the, and and Howard the Duck was one of the few was one of those mainstream comics that people would mention, like, you know, this one is really good. So um, the thing about Howard is obviously he's a duck, um, um, a walking, talking duck. Um, but he's mostly living in Cleveland, Ohio. I'm from Columbus, Ohio, so I totally appreciated this. And um, Cleveland, in the you know whatever you think of Cleveland now, in the 1970s, Cleveland was just um, a, considered to be a disaster area. Um, Howard calls it the armpit of Ohio. Um, and um, so instead of New York, there he is, and he's encountering all of these um, bizarre characters. But mostly, what was great about Howard was his attitude. Um, he he would always talk about being trapped in this world of hairless apes and as humans. He thought we were all kind of ridiculous. Um, he never wanted to be a hero. He never wanted to get involved in things. He's always being dragged into these weird encounters with um, like strange homeless people and um, and people possessed by turnips and so on and so forth. But in, instead of making it just all parody, it's all about his reaction to absurdity um, and his ongoing sense that um, the world is just not not right and maybe not even worth saving. I mean, one of the things that I, I talk about in moving the 60s to the 70s is that Stan Lee had this whole very 60s humanism thing, which is like the importance of being dot, dot, dot human. You know, nothing's better than being human. And for Howard, Howard is a, a, a duck who for, is human for one issue. And his attitude towards human nature, towards humans is human, um, humans suck. Being human suck. And there's really nothing worse than being human. Um, and he's smart and he's clever and he's funny, but he also kind of, he also, um, he also cares. Um, but it's really his voice, um, the narration either by him or around him um, that that I found just so valuable, valuable to have this this um, this basically kind hearted cynicism um, um, and a sense that, you know, the, the things are just kind of crappy. Um, I absolutely just loved. 
Um, and you never knew what was going to happen from one issue to the next because Steve Gerber didn't. Um, he he uh, always did all this plotting at the last minute. And it was unlike any, Steve Gerber's comics were unlike anything that you could read in mainstream comics at the time. Um, so I got hooked on almost everything he did in the 70s. It, it was so much fun to revisit even just, you know, uh, little portions of it and to think about it again, because the context, as we said before, has changed even so much like from when I took this class with you. Um, and it's, you know, I think that, you know, for somebody who just came up on Marvel through the Marvel Cinematic Universe, like Howard the Duck would probably be the most surprising thing in the world, as would like maybe this whole period, you know, because like, like the movie world is like, you know, like, doesn't have a lot of hard edges you know it like tries really hard to be like inoffensive so that it can please like global markets and all these things and it's calculated in that way and the 70s stuff just feels so much like messier and raw and yeah just a lot more um uh weird I guess <laughs> at the end of the yeah. day yeah <laughs> but I think you can there is a through line that goes from Howard the Duck to Harley Quinn and Deadpool um they're very different characters and all that but but um a humor that i mean the, the both of those are way more over the top than howard the duck which is funny because howard is a duck not a human um but um a kind of running commentary on um the absurdity of the situations they're in or making them more absurd um i think that's something that uh really goes back to gerber i mean he never he never actually did write harley quinn for an episode of two episodes of batman and superman it was rather rather fun i don't think he ever did deadpool um mm -hmm. but that but um, that kind of um, absurdity, I think, uh, can can go back to Gerber. Mm, very cool. So, yeah, like based on, um, you know, your work as a scholar and your uh, status as a fan, like where do you see um, Marvel heading? And I don't really mean like the cinematic universe now, but rather like the books, like um, I'm not super caught up on them anymore. And so I'm not really sure of how far they've diverged from the movies. But I wonder, like, do you still see any of that 70s influence in things? Or is it all sort of uh, a lot different now? I actually see more of it now because um, I've been I've done so I've like I did a reread before I read all of Marvel um, from from the first uh, from the first Fantastic Four up to whenever whatever moment that was. Um, and that helped for this book. And I'm also now writing uh, Marvel in the 1980s. Um, so I, I, my joke is that Marvel in the 1990s will just be a vomit emoji because it's so terrible. Um, <laughs> there's, there's stuff there. But but as I imagine, as I trace Marvel going forward, you know, the terribleness of the 90s is fascinating. And then how it gets out of it with Quesada and, and Jameis and the others in the 2000s. But um, what I think is really interesting and where there is some 70s influence is has to do also with Marvel and DC, how in some way they've kind of traded places that in the 70s, Marvel was the place to go if you wanted stories that felt like they were about something and mm -hmm. that uh, and where stories were developed. Whereas uh, DC tended to have one-off stories, um, continuity that was very thin, character development that was thin, um, and just, you know, for the most part was fluffy. Um, and then, st then I think through some terrible misinterpretations of Watchmen and Dark Knight Returns, um, the whole industry got grim and gritty, but DC just got grimmer and grittier so that, um, you know, you have Superboy Prime tearing the arm off of a character twice um, and 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 uh, Roy Harper getting re-addicted to heroin and talking to a dead cat, um, that DC just got so dark in an unproductive way. I mean, I'm, I have no problem with darkness, but it just got dark for its own sake. Just as also DC then got so obsessed with continuity for its own sake. I mean, I feel like at this point, the main character of DC is its own continuity. Um, mm -hmm. Like you read DC to see how are they going to disrupt the continuity next, right? Um, whereas Marvel was the one that had the big continuity stuff. And Marvel was the one that had more interpersonal drama. And what I think Marvel has done really well ever since um, the early 2000s when Quesada came in and James Kane came in is balancing drama and, and humor. Um, Marvel has much more room for being funny, and this precedes the, the, the cinematic universe, for not taking itself too seriously, for being lighthearted, um, but not offensively lighthearted, in a way that DC, for the most part, just cannot pull off. Mm -hmm. um, for Harley Quinn, they can do it, maybe. But um, Marvel, and Marvel, Marvel can give you a character like um, Kamala Khan, Ms. Marvel, right? Um, who, you know, they're, a lot, they're high stakes there, um, and there's you know, important issues, but she's just fun, right? Um, there is, a, I think... Marvel has ma managed to find a way to keep the fun going um, while they're also advancing whatever they're doing with the universe and so on and so forth. So that to me, that, that seems to be where they still 
still for the most part are going um that is the most encouraging thing about marvel for me is that they they, they have found this way um to strike a balance or to let also to let different types of stories happen in their universe and in their line um and strangely it'd be a little bit less in lockstep than dc is so i'm actually pretty optimistic about marvel at the moment Nice. That's really good to hear. <laughs> well, <laughs> thank you so much for joining us, you know, and I hope that you'll consider coming back, uh, you know, no rush, obviously, but when you get that 80s book out, when you're working on that, I'd love to talk about that too. So Absolutely. I'd love it. Thank you so much for having me. No problem. All right, listeners, please pick up Marvel in the 1970s, The World Inside Your Head. Uh, you can go to your favorite independent bookstore or library, wherever you get your books. Um, yeah. Thank you for joining us. It is time to close this chapter. It's time to close this chapter of Turn the Page. Join us for the next episode.